Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks for joining me today. Um, I'll be doing parameters this time around, and I know you're all excited about that. I mean, what gets more exciting than parameters? Okay, right. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> I did a presentation, I think it was back in September, and um, I did on templates. And it was sort of along these same kind of lines as we're trying to explore the, uh, and understand Revit and what's underneath the hood here. So the element system, the graphical system, and then parameters. So if you look at the breakdown of this, at least uh, in this kind of a diagram, the element system feeding into this, the colored ones that are in a column um, there with category, family types, and instances, that sort of thing is the hierarchy of uh, Revit. So at the top of that list is category, right? Whether it's annotative in nature or whether it's model in nature. Um, you make your way down, you got the families. Underneath that are types and instances. And you can see that the element system was feeding into the family level there. Um, by the time you get to the graphical system, we actually um, had that as a part of the um, presentation before when we were looking at templates because additional settings, uh, object styles, things like that feed into it as well. And that's ha happening at the category level. Um, today we're going to be concentrating down at this level here uh, with parameters. So parameters feeding in, I call them system, but um, they're the predefined ones that uh, Autodesk gives to you and says, it shall be so. Kind of like categories, they say, it shall be so. These are your categories. You can't make one called Wendy's really cool duck system like you can in AutoCAD. You actually have to work with a thing called duct, duct accessory, duct fitting, right? Um, it's uh, uh, laid upon us. So then, you know, predefined ones, shared ones, project, and family. So um, I also additionally have added in global. Now, it's not on my diagram here, but um, it was available to 2016 subscription customers, and now it's in 2017. And so I'll be showing you that today as well. It's a new feature in there. That will feed in at the type and instance level. So um, here's, here's the, some of the good news, bad news about it. And part of what I wanted you to do was to think about where you're going with parameters and then decide, um, here's, the, here's the strength of what I want to do. Um, I want to do this with it. Ooh, I better not put the parameter on this way because it can't tag or something like that. So just knowing even these basic things right here can save you a lot of time, right? So I was a little bit concerned about the whole hockey stick here, right? So I had like 70 uh, happy people joining me, and then all of a sudden I had 146 signed up. And I thought maybe it was because two days ago Revit 2017 shipped. So um, I don't know if you thought I was going to do Revit 2017. I've been assured that you haven't. But um, I tell you what I did do, though, was last night I loaded Revit 2017, and I'm going to do it today. <laughs> we'll see how it goes, OK? If I crash and burn once, um, we're firing 2016 up, and I'll finish the presentation there. I've already found a couple of things that aren't the same. But global parameters, for example, that was just right in there, right? I didn't have to be a subscription customer to have the new Fisher Price button that's in there. Um, and, and we'll, you know, if I, if I have some time, um, I'm going to do a lot of quick picks. And you're going to go, what did he pick? What did he pick? What did he pick? Like, it, it, theoretically, I'll be going kind of fast unless I stumble. But um, if, if we're doing OK on time, I have a few slides that are, I think it's uh, May 26th is when we're doing the webinar on what's new. So, and if you're watching this on YouTube, we're talking 2016, by the way, the year 2016, May 26. And if I can, I'll just like flip through them really fast, you know, like 10 seconds each or something, so you can kind of get a sense for what might be kind of interesting in your realm, okay, whether that's M, E, P, structure, et cetera, okay? So looking at this, um, predefined, they're really powerful. You can use them in schedules and tags, okay? Shared. Um, yeah, I think of it as kind of the uber one. It's multiple projects. It spans across them. And it can be used in schedules and tags. I'm also going to show you that we can export out the non-graphic information as a part of that 
to an external database, I'm going to use Microsoft Access, make some changes and pump it right back into Revit and populate the parameters. It's really powerful, and we'll talk more about that soon. Project parameters, I use them all the time. Um, it's very flexible. A lot of times I just want to get something in a schedule. Um, I can do it myself. Mere mortals can do it without needing um, you know, a lot of other involvement from you know, BIM managers and such like that. Um, family, you know, of course, now we're talking about the family editor. So family parameters, um, they cannot appear, the, the, the parameters you put in there cannot appear in schedules nor in tags, but have a power of their own. I'm going to use it to drive some dimensions. Surprise, surprise. Um, that's a common use of it. So right away when we start digging into these, uh, you'll see that this big wordy dialogue comes up. Um, when you're working with project parameters and shared parameters, you get a dialogue like this at a minimum. And right in that area with type and instance is a control that we decide whether or not it's going to be applied to the entire family or whether it's just going to be on the instance itself, an individual element, right? So um, you'll see me toggle that depending on how I want to use it. Um, as, as a user of Revit, you make decisions as you go, for better or worse. Um, for example, I can start a family that uh, is mechanical equipment. And it'll schedule like mechanical equipment, and it'll tag like mechanical equipment. Clear at the category level, you know, like if you think about that category, family, type, instance, hierarchy. I can start it as mechanical equipment and make a chair, okay? It'll look like a chair, it'll move around like a chair, and it'll turn on and off with the mechanical equipment and schedule with mechanical equipment, okay? That's because I made a, a you know, bad move, right? So you're given the power to do stupid things, and if you've ever been to Revit City and downloaded your own stuff off of there, maybe you've seen some of those really uh, righteous decisions that were made, right? Okay, some, some of them are harder than others, so like specialty equipment, commercial kitchens, you know, like, what is that? Mechanical equipment, electrical equipment? You know, what is that stuff? I, I have a hard time with that, too. So. Um, you know, when we're looking at the built-in parameters, I'm going to start with that one first, so predefined parameters. I thought that this is, might be the place to start because a lot of times you look at something I build for you or you have laid out in front of you and you go, wow, somebody really put a lot of time and effort into that. And, you know, by the way, don't stop thinking I put a lot of time and effort into things, but, oh, by the way, some of this stuff is just predefined by Autodesk. It just comes out of the box. So I'm going to try a couple of really quick things for you, just making some stuff um, from scratch so that you can see. I didn't have to do anything, and I just got a bunch of parameters, manufacturer, model number, so on and so forth, as far as fields. What we're seeing normally off to the left on your screen are instance-based parameters showing up in the property palette there. For example, like image comments, the mark, okay, like, you know, door number or something like that if you want to. If you hit edit type, and you get under the hood, it's a type-based parameter. So you, there's a bunch of those that are created as well. Now, why would Autodesk do that? Well, they look at this and they go, hey, uh, I think people real commonly are going to recreate this and this and this and this. Let's just put it on from the get-go. So that when they make it, if it makes sense, they can use it. If it doesn't make sense, they don't use it. Okay? But this way, as users, we don't have to keep recreating that over and over and over again. Okay? Let's give it a shot. Let's see how I do here. All right, 2017, don't let me down. Okay. Let me just start up. Again, since this is predefined, I'm going to have to start with a blank or you won't be able to tell, you know, that I didn't create something in advance. So here are uh, the architectural template, right, out of the box. So I say that I want to draw a new pipe. <clears throat> pipe. And I go, hey, look at there. I didn't do anything, and I've got a whole bunch of parameters already set up on it. I hit edit type. I already got some parameters on it. I didn't have to do anything, okay? Autodesk laid this out for me on a silver platter. Beautiful thing. Now, if that's not your realm, if you're not into pipe, uh, let's go over here to wall, for example. Start issuing the wall. I look here. Oh, look at there. I've got a bunch of parameters on it already. I hit edit type. Look down here. 
a bunch of new parameters, identity data and things. Now, now, depending on what you fire up, they'll be a little bit different. Like, for example, here, I think second from the bottom here is fire rating. You know, that's not going to make sense on a pipe unless it's plastic, I guess, PVC. But <laughs> um, I guess you could make a parameter on it. But um, fire rating here, they said, you know what, actually, we'll give them just another one. That's a pretty common thing. So they're trying to help us out here and make life easier for us, OK? So same thing with with um, the family editor. So, so let's go there. I'll be doing family parameters soon, but I wanted you to see the predefined ones that come with that. So um, the only way you're going to know for sure is if I do this, if I go new family. And um, let's say, um, oops, did I just hit open? Yeah. New family. There we go. And I'm going to say uh, mechanical equipment. Okay, and um, I'll just create an extrusion here. Um, doesn't really matter what size it is, that's not the point. And finish that up and turn around and load it into the project and place, 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 place. Okay, there we go. New family created, just that fast. Uh, I select on it, got some parameters on it already and marked, filled out. And look at there, I got identity dated on it already. I didn't have to do anything here. Now, that's not to say that when you open up, you know, something in the family editor, there isn't a million parameters, you know, lathered on that thing. I'm just saying this is free, right? And very powerful, right? We can use this in a schedule and so on and so forth. For example, I'm going to come in here to manufacture and put in uh, Benson. Whoops, sorry. I think they were bought by Siemens now. And model number one, two, three, four, five, just making that up, and say OK. And if I turned around and made a schedule fast enough, new schedule, mechanical equipment, a bunch of new ones in here in 2017, so I've got to make sure I hit the right one. Uh, family and type, manufacturer, model number, OK. Ta da! Ta-da! I mean, it's just that easy, right? Um, thank you. I'm done. Okay. All right. Maybe not. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Maybe I'm not done. Okay. So how about this? Uh, this was model in nature, right? Pipe, wall, uh, mechanical equipment. How about a tag? Okay. Let's do this. Now, I know I'm just picking on buttons really fast. You know, you want to take a class for me, you can go ahead and pick through. but. Um, also, this will be on YouTube, so you can just hit pause. If there's really something during this presentation that you're going, what button did you press? Just back it up, back it up, and you'll know, OK? So, and uh, OK, so let's go new. And it's a new family. And it's annotative in nature and a generic tag. OK. Um, I found out something last night when I was practicing that's different for you 2017 users. Um, if I put in manufacturer and model number and then say it's a mechanical equipment tag, uh, it nukes everything I put in. Um, not a feature. Autodesk, if you're listening, you know, <laughs> this is it's only shipped for two days, but Surface Mac 1. Okay. All right, so here, let's do this. Um, let's remember to do this first. <clears throat> so that, whoops, family types, so I want the other one. This one right here. I'm going to shift it over from generic and tell it to be mechanical. Uh, mechanical equipment tag, there we go. OK, then I'm going to put in my parameter. OK, so this is a label here-ish. And I want manufacturer and model number. And I'll put in a line break between them. Say OK. I'll reposition it like that. And then I'll load it into the project, into project one. And bingo, 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 bingo. Very easy, right? Um, all of the parameters were there in the tag, and, and I'm talking about this, right? So let me just get back to that. Let's see. So it's, it'll get me back. You know, when I said, oops, the wrong button again, label. I could just do it off of this, edit label. 
These parameters all stacked up on the left side. I don't know if you're familiar with this. I, I guess I'm kind of just assuming, but they, the ones on the left side are available parameters, and then by the time I, I know, throw them over the wall onto the right side, then they're going to show up, right? So that's what I was doing, just flipping them across, right? But they were available. I didn't have to create anything. Notice I didn't. Okay. All right. Close out of this one. Let me just clean up my trail just a little bit here. Leave the project open. Those are predefined. Let's look at families next. Families, <clears throat> for family parameters, um, they control variable values. So um, I'm at least going to do dimensions. You know, uh, that's you know that's a classic, right? We can put in formulas like the diameter of this is you know twice what the radius is, so on and so forth, kind of a thing. Um, I'll, I'm, I'll see how time's going. I don't want to get too crunched on time, but. Um, I thought maybe I'd also do a material one too. You can't, you don't want to get too hung up on it just being dimensions because this is, this is the power on the family level. Um, they're specific to the family. And um, if you are doing nested, so we're talking about making a family and then make another family and then uh, have the two in there, you can actually have them control, uh, like the host controlling the, um, an association between the parameters as well. So this can be super powerful, right? Closer look at family parameters. Let's go do it. Okay, I will, instead of making this one for you from scratch and working till three o'clock, <laughs> I started it first already. So let me open up a family here. Okay, so this is a, a pipe fitting that I, was, that I started already. Okay, so it's got some parameters already hanging on it. Surprise, surprise. You can see some of them here displayed. What I haven't done so far on this was I put on a couple of pipe connectors. So here's one of them. Uh, you can see it's not being controlled by the diameter of um, the fitting. And then there's another one on this end as well. And I actually want to have it pick up on the um, um, nominal radius and then be double that to be the diameter. And then therefore, when a pipe is connected to it, it'll uh, change size from, I have a, two different ones set up with a four inch and six inch one, right? So, and I know you're all different backgrounds with, you know, architect types and electrical engineers and stuff, but you'll get this, right? And think of it in your own realm, okay? All right, let's give this a shot then. Okay, so um, let's go to family types again in this one. So here's what I've set up in here so far. Um, I created a bunch of parameters in here that are dimensional in nature, and I've given some of them values already, and you can see that I already have some of them that are using formulas, so pipe outside radius times 1.5 will give me the hub radius, so on and so forth, right? Um, you know, don't get too hung up on that. Let's, you know, just stay kind of high, like uh, here's what it's all about, right? So I'm going to make a new one in here, so I'll say this. Here's a new one, and I'm going to call this um, nominal. Uh, diameter, dia, and um, I'll make it instance-based. Now, um, if you recall right in this area here, I had um, said that the um, type or the instance can be created. So um, I could be doing either of these. Uh, in, actually, in this one, I probably would want it to be type-based uh, as well. Um, down here, uh, we could have it uh, just associated with the discipline of piping and it'll be pipe size in nature, and it's a dimension. Okay, easy enough. So I'm using, up here at the top, you'll see, I'm making a family parameter that cannot appear in schedules or tags, but that's not the point of what I'm trying to do here, okay? Um, there's actually a part down here where you can make reporting parameters that can show up in a schedule, uh, not what I'm doing at the moment, though. Okay, we'll swing back to the second choice on here, shared parameters soon. Uh, in 10 minutes. <laughs> we'll swing in on that. So family parameters for this one. Okay, so um, I make the parameter, say okay. Okay, so there it is, nom diameter. And right now it's set to zero. There's nom radius here. So I'm going to set up a formula on it. So here's nom radius. And I'm going to have nom radius times two. 
And then see how it's zero right now? As soon as I click out of the cell, it picks up on that dimension, you know, the formula. It's formulatic. Yeah, I was reading that last night. Thought I'd use it today. Okay. <laughs> Not sure I used it right, but I gave it a shot anyway. But okay, anyway, say okay to that. So anyway, now we got that. So um, we got the parameter, but we haven't really associated it with anything yet. So uh, let's select this connector. And let's, I'm um, holding down my control key, I'm going to select the other connector. Um, if you are really following me, I'll try not to use too many shortcut keys in case later you're watching this um, on uh, YouTube or something. Um, th here's the diameter right here, and I know I could just fill in a number, but there's a little button off here to the side that I'm going to click on, and that actually goes for the parameters. And then if I can find uh, nominal diameter, there it is right there, and I say OK. It's now associated with that. Did you notice that uh, the thing shrunk down, right? It, it, now it's locked in and has to do with other things that are flexing around in there, so the connector will be right on that. And I'm going to skip materials, but you can make another one that's material in nature and then make it a different shade of gray. <laughs> it's not a very... Uh, Anyway, with a pipe fitting, I guess that's about it. So um, anyway, let's try and uh, let's, let's load it into the project here. So uh, load it into project, and I'll place one. Maybe I'll go over to 3D here. Take a look at it. Here it is. And I'll go to shaded so you can, maybe you can see it a little bit better there. Um, so there it is off to the side. And really what I'm talking about here is that um, if, if you're not in this realm, uh, not one of my plumbing engineers. Um, this says it's a four inch diameter pipe that it's looking to do. If I change it to a different type that's six inch, uh, you'll see the number changes on that too, right? So we're controlling that. Uh, um, incredibly powerful. Um, I use this a lot in the realm of um, family. In a minute, I'll show you global parameters, which is kind of new to the game. Um, Take note of some of what you just saw there. Even if you're not a family editor, you're going to see some similarities there. The ability to put in formulas and, and control things, but they don't have to be there side by side. You know, like when I change a window on one side of the building, it changes on the other side of the building too. It's kind of interesting stuff. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let me go ahead and close out of this one. And close out of this one. Family parameters. Global parameters, up until a little bit ago, were only available in 2016 to subscription customers, which, by the way, um, if you haven't moved to 2017 yet, which is now a magic button in there that's right um, out of the box, um, the, um, you'll find a global parameters one that just one day showed up. I don't think it was there when I first started up with 2016. I looked back probably on Serv they don't call them service packs anymore, they're update releases, okay? Which actually, this is, that's true though, you know, okay, granted, especially if Autodesk is watching this, um, the idea of the update release is not just about um, fixing bugs, which um, I do appreciate that they do that sort of thing, but it's, they've been trying to, um, uh, well, at least for subscription customers anyway, for a couple of releases now, take new functionality that they got pretty well down pat and put it into, uh, releases that haven't come out yet. Um, so, like, I already know sort of how to get around inside of global parameters before I even get 2017. Um, they change it around some. When you're back, um, you're going to see me in 2017 um, working with it, and like a couple of the buttons that I pick are up in the ribbon now. Uh, you'll find them in the options bar. Uh, they just decided the UI should be a little bit different, the user interface should be a little different. Um, you can drive and report values. Um, I'm going to use it to drive values. Um, I'll use it as a dimensional constraint to drive it. Um, and then basically I'll associate the parameter, the global parameter, with an element that is dimensioned. Okay? And I'll, I'll, do a couple, I'll just do a couple of real simple ones here um, to show you what it's like. Um, this guy right here, I actually did a screen capture of this, and by the, I was trying to think how I would explain this, and it's probably just easier just to do it. So let me go do it. <clears throat> and I, I'm, this is, I'm going to be winging this, so 
Um, good luck, Kurt. Okay, uh, open architecture, here we go. Okay, so basically all I'm gonna do is just as a simple start to this is I'm gonna build one for you from scratch because I was just gonna show you some over here at the end and then move on at the end of the building here, that, a couple that I've got in place already. But um, I'm gonna just draw a couple of walls in here. Um, here, let's do this. And then I'll draw another one, say over here somewhere. And another one over here somewhere. There we go, oops, back to this one a wall. You know, basically, I'm just kind of making a yard sale of walls out here a little bit. Okay, so uh, global parameter, then you come here, and um, project parameter, shared parameter, there's the new button, global parameter. Okay, and make a new global parameter here. I got the window distance one going on over here, but let me make a couple of new ones. So I'll make one called um, L1, like length one, and it's a length, okay. And I'll make another one called L2, L2, and it's a length. And I'm gonna make um, L2 be L1 divided by two. So if this was four, that would be two. If this was nine, That'll be four foot six. Kind of looked like the family parameter that we were working with earlier. So far, the wing in it's going good for me. Whew. Okay, all right, now let's try, let's try this then. You set up a couple of things like this, global parameters on what you want to get done. Then out here, I'm just gonna use an aligned dimension. And like on this wall, I'll go from here to there and place it. And uh, over here, I'll go from, say from here, to there and place it. And I'll go from here to there and place it. And then finally from here to there and place it too, okay? So um, you, you guys know dimensioning, you've been doing it all along. Um, here's, here's kind of the new uh, piece to this is, if I pick on one of the dimensions and I look up here, here are the parameters I've set up, window distance, L1, L2. And um, once again, uh, you'll find if you're using 2016 and you're under subscription, this, this drop-down list will be right here on the options bar. So um, I'm gonna make that one be L1. And it just lengthened and a little pencil showed up there. Um, this guy over here, L1. This guy over here, L2. This guy over here, L2. Okay, so all the dimensions just changed on this, right? And now, and here becomes uh, kind of how you would use this, you know, like later I come back and I pick on this dimension, and I go, ooh, you know, I want to change something on it. Oh, so what I do is, um, if instead of actually reassigning it, I just want to uh, edit it, there's a pencil there, and when I click on that, I get my parameter, global parameters that come up. You know, so for here, let me kind of shove this off to the side. I'll do something kind of radical. Now you know that this is going to affect this one right here and this one right here, and then consequently it's gonna affect these. Well, actually there's one over here on the opposite side too. So um, I'll change it to five foot and say apply. I'll change it to 15 feet and apply. I'll change this one to six and apply. Right, so uh, depending on what your realm is, you know, like what, the things I've been experimenting with have been um, duct. Um, I, I can keep it the top of duct in my zone. I don't know if you're in, you know, in, in this realm or not, but keep it a certain distance below the level, uh, structural and the like. But maybe I wanna, if the floor thickens or the structure changes, make it drop not based on level, but on depth of beam and stuff. I'm gonna have to work with it a little bit more because so far I'm having to keep, like I gotta have the floors in my model instead of in the link, it's trying to move the wrong ones, but I got some, I got some exploration to do. Okay, the window one, right now I have it set for four. I wanted to, you to see kind of how this works. So um, here, here's the window, right? 
And it'll look like this uh, when you pick on the window itself, but if you pick on the dimension, it looks like that, right? So now we know that if you click on this and you change that to five feet, like that, the window's gonna shift over, right? So what I wanna do is I wanna keep, I got two windows, I wanna keep some symmetry going on here. So I select the dimension and I say, you shall be window distance and then it shifts to that um, side too, right? So um, I, I select this, I click on that, I say be nine feet, that'll be it. Whoops, did I just roll that up? Whoops, I rolled it up all together. Nine feet, there we go, back. Nine foot, okay, like that. All right, if, um, I'll show you one last thing on it too because picture this, you know, you have a multi-story building and you got windows going all the way up like that on several sides of the building. You set up this kind of global parameter, you change it in one place and it cascades up and down the building on sides you can't even see. That could be cool, right? Um, if later on uh, you want to delete this, like I don't really want the dimension out there, I just wanted to use it as a controlling factor. Um, I'm going to select it and then I'll hit the delete. And I think you've seen this before with dimensions of equality, right, the EQ. It says, do you want to unconstrain it or would you like me to remember? And I'm gonna say okay. And uh, still it remembers that this is part of that global parameter family here. You know, I shouldn't say family. And if you click on it, you'll actually get this kind of thing going on to be able to edit it again, okay? Global parameters. Right? Just a taste of probably a gazillion things you can do with this. It's actually kind of exciting to me. Okay. Project parameters next. Um, this it actually is in some way limiting, right? It's, it's only specific to the project that I'm working in. I use them a lot though. It's like really nice. Um, I can set them up easily. They can schedule. Right? Um, it, I'll be doing, you know, actually I think, you know, when you think about project parameters, you think about elements, right? You know, like model stuff that you're trying to put a parameter on. But it doesn't have to just be on um, model elements. We can put them on views, things like that, that actually I shouldn't have um, just discounted the parameters that are on views that are pre-created, right? The predefined ones from Autodesk, those sort of things. On sheets, right? Um, it can't be shared with other projects, though, so it doesn't span that spectrum, right? Um, but you can use it for scheduling, sorting, and filtering. Let's give it a try. All right, so the walls in here. Um, if I select on one of the walls and I look at the parameters on it, got that. If I hit edit type, I got this. Let's look down under identity data. I want a new parameter on this called sound transmission class, right? Uh, how much sound will it uh, transmit? So, um, for example, um, STC 33 is uh, residential construction, you know, just the kind of normal um, two by four construction, how much would transmit? So 33, a low number, means it transmits a certain quantity of sound, you get up around closer to like 63, and now we're pretty muffled, okay? So higher numbers are better. I'm just gonna make some stuff up here anyway, but um, I want a new one in here called S sound transmission class, depends on whether I wanna type it in or not. So um, to do that, I go to the, um, to the manage tab, and project parameters are right here. Okay, there's already a list, a ton of lists in here, so I click on add. Okay, project parameter up at the top. Earlier we saw the same kind of dialogue and it kind of looked the same except that, uh, I think this was missing over here to the side and it said family parameter and shared parameter. This one's the project parameter. And it'll even tell you, it'll guide you if you don't have my cheat sheet from before, can appear in schedules but not in tags. Okay, so if that works for you, um, I'm just, I don't feel like typing. So I'm gonna type in STC and I'll make it common, um, I'll make it text, because we're gonna want like STC 33, not just an integer in there, perhaps, if that's what you're looking for. 
And then where do you want to group it under? So um, I'd like it to be grouped underneath identity data and be type-based. So grouping, uh, we're talking about over here. Where would the eye be drawn of a user when they're trying to put in a sound transmission class? Either here or if they did edit type and they were under the hood, where would they look for it? Okay, so if, if you said uh, materials, um, it'd make, if it wasn't showing up already in the, uh, in the list there, it would make a new one called that and put it yours underneath it. But, you know, then you wouldn't be able to find it when you're looking for it, right? So I'm telling it to look under identity data and be type-based, so any of the other walls that are that type. And then over here, what do I want to affect? I'm going to affect walls. Okay, good enough. I think I got it. Say okay. And then I say okay. Now if I select on this wall that it was on just a moment ago and I hit edit type, theoretically, if I come down here, oh, and there you go. And we'll give this a 38. You know, maybe here we'll give, we'll do it this way, then you can see at the back easier. STC 38. Okay, we made it text-based so we can do that. I made a new parameter, just that easy, right? Okay, so um, let's do a couple others here. I'll just do, I'll say okay to that one. So all of them of that type, you know, here's another wall. It's a little heftier. I say you are um, STC56, uh, making that up. Okay, so there's a couple wall types that are created. I made a wall schedule over here already that has a couple of fields in it. Um, and because you already saw me build a schedule from scratch. Here's a bunch of different wall types in here. I want a new column in here of a sound transmission class. So I click on fields and hopefully it's there and yes, there it is. So I add that in. Uh, it's just that easy. I say okay and there's the two that we just created, right? Wasn't that easy? Right? I use project parameters a lot. Um, the other thing that's nice about that is if you're, you know, you, you got colleagues all around you and they're creating um, uh, stuff as well. Uh, you know, um, the nursing home they're working on and the school somebody else is working on. You don't have to get buy-in, you know, um, un unless you have uh, a BIM management thing where you're trying to keep things. Um, Actually, that was, I probably shouldn't have said that at all. Actually, you need to get buy-in from your BIM manager. Okay. Um, when, you, when we get to shared parameters, I guess you'll see a little bit of what I'm talking about because shared parameters, you know, it's actually a, like a, a firm thing, a company thing, right? You, you need to put it in. It's about consistency very much that way. So this one's a little bit more willy-nilly. Now, this can't show up in a tag, though. If I wanted to tag something, STC something or other, I should have chose a different method like uh, shared parameters to get that done, okay? Um, I'm not going to do views because I did it real briefly, and I, I think I ended up on YouTube, but if you want to take a look at it, um, I did a um, project parameter one on views, and it was about reorganizing the project browser so that you could have working and printing views so that you could actually find organize the project browser, but also um, not have to worry about changing the view range and the crop and turning things on and off in a working view that would affect what's on paper. So for example, just to talk back through that, but then you can go find me. I, I'm pretty sure it's posted. Um, it's real close to the end of the presentation. I did a little bit of that and made printing and working views, and then I think I slapped a view template on top of it for that. Um, it's the same kind of a process here, except that when I, when I do a project parameter and add it, it's just that over here, instead of it being something like walls, I would tell it to be something kind of esoteric like a view, right? And so, you know, realize this doesn't have to just be model in nature when we're working with that. Okay, shared parameters. Let me close this one. <clears throat> Okay, shared parameters. This is a real powerful one, right? It can be used in multiple projects and multiple families, right? So it's kind of the uber one. Mm, predefined ones are pretty uber too, but, um, but this is 
this is like something that we can do, right? We don't have to get Autodesk buy-in to be able to put it on there, right? Um, so you can use it in a family or a project, and, um, and it can be stored, it gets stored as a separate file outside of your RVT, so therefore there becomes uh, the way that it can be used across multiple projects. And um, from where I was reading in a book there, it said protected from change, therefore it can be tagged and scheduled as well. Okay, now uh, when I create, I'm not going to be creating one from scratch here because chances are at your firm you already have one. It's a TXT file. Um, uh, it, actually, you can open it up in Notepad. Don't open it up in Notepad. There's no reason to open it up in Notepad. Um, but it's a TXT, okay? But it gets created magically from inside of Revit when you um, tell it the first time I want to create a shared parameter file. It says, what do you want to name it? Where do you want to put it? And it gives it a TXT extension. Accept that, and they give you a warning right in the top of the TXT. It says, you know, don't mess with this. Actually, they don't quite say that. I'm just kind of paraphrasing, but something like that. Like, don't mess with this, because you can really muck it up, you know? And it's true. Okay, so, so actually from a workflow standpoint, somebody, you know, yourself maybe, if you're that firm, or your BIM manager or somebody creates one. Right, to be used across the firm. Um, actually, in larger firms, what I do is I, I usually think about at least creating two. If um, I'll put civil architecture and structural engineers together into one uh, shared parameter file, and then I'll put MEP into another one. But you know, it depends on the size of your organization and all. Um, this way, if I were to put in voltage in the share as a shared parameter and type in voltage. I don't have to worry that Wendy here is um, creating a project called and uses Volt, and then we can't, uh, it won't schedule, you know, like it's not looking for the same parameter for that. There's just like a ton of reasons for that, right? So usually, just to kind of swing back, somebody creates it, they keep the master under lock and key, the little TXT, they put a copy of it up onto some shared drive, and they make that read only. Okay, so that you can't write into it yourself. You can just read out of it, right? And or um, they don't bother with the read-only part, and if somebody mucks it up, they have the master, and they just throw another one up there. Okay? All right, very powerful. Let's go take a look. All right, for this one, I'm going to open up <clears throat> this guy. Do I dare say that Revit 2017 is working perfectly for me, or is that, like, dangerous? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Who said that? Um, okay. All right. So far, so good. I, you know, I have been really impressed. But, you know, I was at Autodesk a long time when we first uh, acquired Revit, and, and I had used it actually before the acquisition and all. And... Um, uh, it is a really good team. I just, I, I'm really quite impressed with what they put out. Oh, man, I'm going to look back at this YouTube video and really regret everything I've just been saying. Um, okay, all right, good. <clears throat> all right, so let's see. Shared parameters. So let's, um, I got one started already. I go to manage, I go to shared parameters. Um, so here's one, I just started up an easy one. One that has duct and it has a few things, uh, parameters on it. Another one that's pipe and has a few things on it. Um, I was aiming this one more towards pipe fabrication and duct fabrication here. Uh, under pipe, I'm going to create a new parameter. Okay, so like the groups down here, the way that I'm grouping it, it's, it's the idea is to be able to, you know, um, well, just like the word says, group them together so that they're in buckets so that you can better organize yourself and find something later, right? So I, I maybe make some parameters that are just all about piping, some other parameters that are all about duct. If, if we're doing pipe and duct fabrication, for example. So under pipe, for example, I might make a new parameter called um, spool number. And um, let's make it text, because actually we're going to mix together characters in that. Say OK. Under duct, I might make one, a new parameter called um, part number. OK, and we're going to make that one text also. 
I'm going to be following along with the part number one here, so you can see that that is under the group of duct, and uh, it is now part, when I hit OK on this part number, and say OK, um, it is now a new shared parameter, not in my project. Okay, so that, like when I take people through classes, they think they did it, right? Because they're in here, and then they're looking for it going, where is it, right? Actually, think of yourself as two different hats. I'm the BIM manager here, and I make one to be used by all. Now I go to the project, and I put on a different hat or bow tie, if you want. And I say, now I'm going to add it into my project. So it should be at my disposal. OK, so we go to project parameter, which seems kind of funny. And I say, let's add one. And in this case, instead of it being a project parameter like we created just a little bit ago, it's a shared parameter. So I use the next one down. Stuff grays out down here. I click on select. And now we're looking at the shared parameter file that I'm using. So there's pipe, there's duct, there's the new one I made called part number, okay. And whether or not I want it to be instance-based or type-based, uh, I'm going to use instance-based for sure and, and at this time. And where do I want it grouped under? Where does the eye get drawn to when I'm trying to find part number? In this case, you know, I'm, I'm saying identity data, but, you know, use what makes sense to you, identity data. And then off here to the to the right, something that I didn't do before when I was doing walls for STC and I was doing views just to show you, um, it doesn't have to be just one. So if you're making, like if you're doing something that's mechanical equipment, specialty equipment, electrical equipment, plumbing fixture, you can go toggle, 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 and they all get the new parameter at one time. So for example, here I'm going to say I want uh, duct fittings, duct accessories, and ducts. Duck, duck, duck. And okay, part number, okay. Anyway, if I go in a little closer here and I take a look at, you know, if I did this right anyway, take a look at one of these, where are you? There you are, there we go. Look down here, ah, part number, there it is. You know, so I'm just gonna make something up, dink, 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 doop, doop, doop. There's the part number on it, okay? Made a new parameter, it was a shared parameter. It can be used now by somebody else coming in from another project on theirs, and so on and so forth, okay? And go with that. Now, something else though about um, working with shared parameters is that it, you know, is the Uber one, it can appear in tags, I'm not gonna do a tag, but it can appear in tags, it can appear in schedules, you know, trust me. Um, but also can be exported to an external database, right? And I don't know if you've seen that before or not, so I thought I'd do that for you today. Now, in this case, um, I am under subscription, right? That's, therefore, I get this magic button I'm about ready to hit. It does not come with Revit 2017. It does not come with Revit 2016 in, in actually both of them. And what I did was, well, actually in Revit, you know, let me just say, in Revit 2016, I uh, went to the subscription center and typed, I said I want a DB link, and then it said, your subscription customer, big brother knows who you are, here you go, and then I added it in and I got a new button that I'm going to use right now. I just want to make that part clear, it doesn't come with Revit. Um, kind of interesting last night when I loaded Revit 2017 for today, um, I, I got 2017, I just figured I'll just quit out and I'll load up. 2016 for this part of the demonstration and show you there. Um, I see the updates pop up in the corner, you know, Big Brother saying, hey, you need, you know, I know who you are and you need this and this. It raked through, as near as I can tell, it raked through my old versions, 2014, 15, 16, at least it found 16 anyway, and said, you, you might want these applications, here they are. Here's DB Link. it hasn't even been posted yet, and it was presenting it to me and said you want to install it. It had uh, the space naming utility, which is something I use with mechanical engineers and such like that. Very cool, actually, I thought it was kind of nice. Although, you know, the whole Big Brother thing, I understand, but <laughs> good news, bad news. Okay, so, um, all right, so we got, Okay, so we put a part number on this. I'm kind of losing my train of thought here. We put a part number on this. So I go to um, add-ins. There it is. And here's DB Link, Revit DB Link. 
All right, and it's saying, what do you want to drive to? You know, you want to go to Oracle or what do you want to go to? And I say, create a new connection, export. It says, where do you want to go? I'll just, uh, I'll just put it in here so I can clean it up later. And call it Audubon MEP. Save. Chug, chug, chug. So why a database? Why even bother with that? Um, I, I use it for a whole bunch of different meth, um, ideas here. Uh, some, I gotta say, actually are on the facility management, maintenance management end of things. But, um, for example, um, I won't say the, the company's name, but I'm working with a pipe and duct um, fabrication, right? And they're using it during the construction process here. Um, you'll lose this kind of special connection that you have once you get it in this big tabular sort of thing. You're trying to say, where's my stuff? So one of the things you might want to do is consider fleshing out some of the parameters just, just with truncated information, I guess is the word I'm looking for. Just put in some of it and then do the heavy lifting when you get out into the database because we can take tables and joins. Uh, usually what I'll do um, in a more involved one is I'll take an Excel spreadsheet that has a matching unique identifier in some way and I'll put, I'll just, I'll uh, link it into the Microsoft Access table and then when I pump it back in the Revit, which I'm gonna do here in a minute, it takes all those values and puts them in, uh, every single parameter on there gets fleshed out. It's really powerful and uh, like in the fabrication one that I was talking about here, we're using part numbers, spool numbers, sheet numbers, so on and so forth with this. So let's go give this a look, huh? I got Microsoft Access on here. I just created one here, there it is. Let's open it up and see what we got. Kind of weird, I think, is um, it made a gazillion tables for me, right? So these are all tables here, air terminals. You know, some of these are kind of obvious here um, that I would be expecting. But, um, you know, for example, here, for example, here's doors, right? I, I'm... I don't have a door in this project. It's an MEP one. It's in a link, but it, when it creates it, um, it goes in and says everything you can, shared parameters, um, you know, the parameters that I have predefined for you, Curtis, here you go, right? And uh, fleshes it out, waiting to see if something will fill in there for me. You know, so uh, I'll just scroll through the list a little bit in case you want to see. Um, well, anyway, it goes on and on. Here, let's, anyway, uh, Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Let's go, to, let's go to duct fittings. Duct fittings is what we were working on. Sweet, huh? So here's the uh, ID in Revit. And here's the system name, so on and so forth. And here's the part number that we created. That's what I was trying to, you know what, maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll sort this. That's another thing you can do here. Let me sort by mark. Sort A to Z. And then let's go to look at the part number. So I'm, I'm looking at this column right here. Let's scroll down. Ah, there it is right there. The value came out. You know, so some other one, you know, I come in here and I go 7, 3, and I just make it up a number, you know, and some other one, type in some numbers, like that, right? We're making changes. We're doing database stuff, you know, okay? Um, at some point, I hit save, right? Now, also, consider this too, you know, and I say we're doing it. This might be a Revit challenged person, right? Not everybody has Revit out there, right? Some of them are kind of challenged and don't have it, but have engineering background and so on and so forth to be able to come in here and be able to put in values for us. I, I type in some things like this. Um, I'm going to take a look like this guy right here, for example. 9-11-8-51. Okay, meanwhile, back at the ranch, I do this. I go back to DB Link. Here's this a week from Tuesday, and I say this one, edit and import. It stops and asks you, uh, here's what the database looks like. Um, this is regardless whether you have access or not, by the way. Um, one, um, one university that I'm working with, we're, we're doing it actually on the facility management end of things, the same sort of deal. They only have one seat of Microsoft Access. They don't want it around everywhere. So free uh, Microsoft driver 
on the Revit machines. Um, it pumps out the database, and then somebody else picks it up off the server and opens it up in Access and does a bunch of stuff to it, puts it back out there, and they pump it right back into Revit. You don't need Microsoft Access to do this. The driver's free. Uh, we were looking at duct fittings. So here's the table. Okay, and there's you know the area where we had part number here. Oh, and there's the values. And actually, a little bit below that, I'm going to type in some more. You know, here, did I make this integer or did I make a text? Maybe I better just leave it as integers. So I can even do my edits here if I see something that I want to have changed. And when I say OK to that, finishes the import. And here's what the report looks like. I think that's kind of cool if you haven't seen it before. And take note up here at the top. Um, Anything that's normal, uh, you know, was the same as before, it's going to be in gray. And then anything that updated successfully will be in blue. And it'll be in red if there was some kind of a reason that there's an, you know, update problem. And, you know, let me go out here to where the part number is and scroll down. Should see blue here. Ah, there it is, right? I pumped that one out, 84653. I pumped that out so it's gray when it came back in, but whoever was messing around with the Microsoft Access table and or when I stopped and typed in a few things on the way in in the report, um, I got that as well. Sweet. Okay, let's see how that actually ends up looking here. Uh, this guy already had the part number on it, so um, that's actually, there we go, part number. Part number 84653. I'm going to do this yet yeah, before we leave this part of it. Manage, select by ID. The other one was um, 911 851. I should have just copied and pasted show. Oh, yeah, there it is right there. This is one that I messed with out in Microsoft Access. Yeah, there it is. Right there. Anyway, super powerful, right? And whether you choose to use that part of it or not. Shared parameters. Um, here's what it'll look like for the subscription customers. If you're still on 2015, 2016, you can get something that looks like this, exclusive to subscription customers as well. And so anyway, in closing, I guess I just wanted to, um, oh, you know what, actually, I. I I'm going to do that quick run through of what's new. Um, okay, so so just a quickie, you know, 20 seconds per slide kind of a thing, like 30 slides once. Ch check this out. You might you might think it's interesting. Two people didn't. Okay. Okay. Here we go. I, I won't spend much time on any one of them because I know you guys don't do what's new here, but um, this is kind of a of a sneak preview of my May 26th web, webcast. Because I'm going to be doing all of them. No, it's going to be 12 hour long. <laughs> um, they, they lump together the architects and, and platform tools together here. I don't know if that's a good lumping or not, but maybe you'll see. Depth queuing actually is pretty cool. I like that one where you can, you know, see how the buildings in the back are faded out there. Um, I, I, I won't talk to all of these, but. Uh, improved railing hosts. I've run into this before already. Um, uh, actually, the only way I'd seen it done was with Dynamo, like pumping it out the Dynamo and then making magic stuff happen there. Form it, right? Uh, I think of conceptual design for that. Okay, Kurt, you're actually talking through all of them. Stop it. And this one, I don't know what's different. It actually looks exactly the same as it was before. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? Global parameters, imagine that. Why didn't I show that? Well, I did already. Um, fastest ever, they say. Faster software. This actually, I, I teach a class, just a one-day class. It's uh, 3DS Max for Revit users, but I'm pretty envious of this. This is nice. Sweet. Text editor. Tags that can handle calculated values. Uh, more about Dynamo. Tangency locks in the family editor. Actually, that, that could be really helpful for me. Um, view templates in the schedule for structural engineers. I'll go a little faster here, because now we're getting discipline specific. 
rebar, rebar constraints, bent fabric sheets. We were uh, tearing our hair out over this two weeks ago, and we should have just fired up 2017. <laughs> Structural connectivity. They actually spent quite a bit of time on this. You're seeing steel connections and, and you know, like LOD getting up in the 400 kind of range. It's happening in the uh, MEP realm too, uh, mechanical and uh, plumbing realm for sure. Steel content, structural foundation improvements. For MEP and fabrication, obviously Autodesk is spending a lot of time and effort there in R&D. Part modeling improvements, more fabrication layout improvements. You can pause when on the YouTube video if it gets up there fairly fast and take a closer look, or just come to my webcast too. I'm not gonna do it all. Scalability improvements, and thank you. So I don't know if you, did you wanna say anything further with the, here, I'll um, 